joining us today. Um, and, and, and we're going to chat a little bit about levels of engagement and appropriate methods. So I'm so glad to be here and, and, and to talk, talk this through with you guys. So, oops, sorry. I'm just going to. And so just to start off, um, all of us at the Center for Healthcare Innovation, um, I want to acknowledge that we're gathered here on Treaty One land, home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene people, and homeland of the Métis Nation. And coming together today, we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We recognize the ongoing present day colonial violence that is faced by indigenous people within healthcare, education, justice, child welfare and government systems. And we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in a partnership in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And really when we talk about patient and public engagement in health research, it's in fact Indigenous research methodologies that are at the forefront, Indigenous scholars, researchers, and communities we, we can be looking to. And we also believe that when we talk about patient and public engagement in health research, it must be grounded in a social justice and health equity lens. So as we start beginning to talk today a little bit about um, patient public engagement and levels of engagement, I just wanted to make sure <laughs> that I recognize uh, because this uh, session is, is accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons um, to just disclose that I work as the patient public engagement lead at the George and Faye Center for Healthcare Innovation. So some of the objectives, what are we gonna look at today? Well, following this session, attendees should be able to describe the important, oh, this is not the right, <laughs> sorry. I'm just gonna double check. Okay, so we don't have the right objectives there. We're, what we're gonna have is that we, we want everyone to be able to summarize each level of engagement, um, to be able to use CHI's methods of public and patient engagement um, to find different participatory approaches that can be given at every level and then to determine appropriate levels of potential methods of engagement for our own projects. So first of all, when we talk about patient oriented research, because we just have to ground ourselves in, in um, in the in what is patient oriented research before we move forward on levels what comes to mind you guys can either unmute or you can throw it in the chat box any of your thoughts about what might come to mind when we talk about patient oriented research i'll give you a second if not i'll give you the answer don't worry no pressure <laughs> We have a couple things in the chat. Emily says research involving those affected by the research and driven by their input. Nice. Carrie says having patients be part of the research team. Absolutely. Maxine says research that is informed by and accountable to patient partners. That's great. These are good answers. Tannis says, where the topics are what's most important to the patients versus important to others slash us slash organizations. Absolutely. Mariana says, considering the patient interest into the research projects. That's a good one. Wow. So these are all amazing answers. You guys are already <laughs> up to speed on everything. So this is just... Um, this is the definition from the Canadian strategy for patient oriented research around patient, um, what is patient oriented research. And I think you guys hit pretty much every component that they mentioned. So they see it as a spectrum of research that engages patients as partners, like you guys have mentioned. It focuses on patient identified priorities. It improves patient outcomes. It's conducted by multidisciplinary teams in partnership with relevant stakeholders, and it aims to <laughs> apply the knowledge generated to improve healthcare systems and practices. So we have all these five elements that go into what is patient-oriented research. 
Oops, and then we will. And when I say patient and public engagement, I think a lot of you already gave us some really good answers in the chat box. And so really what we mean is that people with lived experience are being meaningfully and actively involved um, in the governance of research. So that means having people with lived and living experience on the research team, on the operations and steering committees, even sometimes in clinical trials on the data safety and monitoring boards. Um, having people in informing research decisions, also having people involved in the priority setting. So what are we looking at with the research project? And also having people with lived and living experience uh, conducting research. So having people perhaps, if you were doing qualitative research, having people do be co-interviewers or co-facilitators of focus groups, and then also people informing the knowledge translation. So how are we going to share the research findings? How are we going to implement them within the system? And the core belief is that if we engage people with lived and living experience, it'll lead to improved health outcomes and an enhanced healthcare system, and it'll increase the quality and the appropriateness and the transparency and relevance of research. So we're really ensuring health research and systems work addresses issues that are important to people who are living with health issues. And a lot of times we have people say, well, what decisions might, might people with lived and living experience be able to help inform? Well, we have lots of examples. We've had people with lived and living experience help to inform uh, research priorities that matter most. So really looking at research, um, things that are of importance to people with lived experience. We have helping uh, shape and clarify the research question so it actually reflects the needs and the concerns of patients and informal caregivers also helping to ensure the methods that are being proposed for the study are appropriate, acceptable and sensitive to the real world context in which patients and caregivers live, work and play. We also have, um, we can also include and engage people with lived and living experience to ensure that research uses outcomes that have true meaning to the lives of patients and informal caregivers and communities. Also to help ensure that the language and the content of the information that's being provided, say to participants in a research project, that they're appropriate and that they're accessible. So everything from questionnaires or surveys to patient part, uh, to uh, participant leaflets, and also it helps to increase uh, participation and recruitment. And also we have a lot of times when we engage uh, people with lived and living experience in health research, what happens is we start identifying wider sets of research topics. So sometimes researchers actually develop an entire program of research after engaging with people with lived experience because they find that there are so many issues of importance that aren't being addressed in research. In the interpretation of research, so sometimes when researchers might look at findings, they may not necessarily identify certain things that someone who's actually living with the health issue might be able to say, hey, that's, that's an opportunity or that's something that we should really be looking at. And then also just making sure that research reflects the concerns and the interests and the values of patients and the public and that money and resources are being used efficiently. So this is, this is kind of the grounding of why we want to engage people with lived experience, what engagement means, and it's really about bringing people together to inform decision-making, and then all the different types of decisions that we can engage people in. So levels of engagement. So just when we thought it could get more complicated, we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper. So we already know that there are many different decisions that people with lived and living experience can help inform along the research, along throughout the entire research process. So from identifying research priorities to thinking about outcomes of importance to interpreting the research findings. And so 
what we what we've learned over time is that there's a spectrum of engagement. Um, oops, just a second. So it's often viewed as a spectrum or a continuum of eng engagement. And so lots of different organizations like um, IEP, like the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Initiative and so on, have always kind of viewed it as a, as a spectrum. And so at the lowest level, we have over here the consultation level of engagement. And then it goes all the way over to the stakeholder um, the stakeholder or user directed, or sometimes you might hear patient directed um, layer of engage or level of engagement. And so the biggest thing is it's at the lowest level, um, that would be the lowest level of research decision making held by people with lived experience. And as we move forward to the stakeholder level, that means more and more decision making power. So at the uh, consultation level, the primary goal is to obtain feedback or input from individuals, uh, caregivers, community members with lived experience of a health issue. And so, for example, researchers can obtain opinions and feedbacks about around what research priorities we should be looking at, um, what questions should we be asking how should we design this study? What kind of things should we consider when we're designing it? Um, and when we're collecting data, what kind of things should we think about as we're analyzing or interpreting the results or the findings? And then how, what things should we think about when we're disseminating uh, the information? And so at the consultation level, the researcher still holds the decision-making power. So a researcher can ask um, for feedback on this decision, but the researcher is the final <laughs> decision-maker. And so this is considered the lowest level of engagement. And some of the, the methods of engagement that can be used include things like interviewing, so having one-on-one -on -one conversations about what priorities we should be thinking about. You can have discussion groups with uh, people with lived experience, um, talking about, say, what outcomes are really important to you and which one should we consider in your research project. You can even have town halls. So if you're doing, if there's something of importance in a geographical area, having a large open gathering and asking um, for feedback or input on a certain decision that you have to make in the research process. So some of the important considerations during this time is that you really have to clearly communicate um, the level. So what decisions can, can people really inform, but also clearly, clearly communicating how people inform those decisions and also being open and, and honest about the amount of decision-making power uh, people have as well. And so, it's really clear communication is such an important part of this aspect. Now at the collaboration stage of research, this is actually what you would um, see as if you were applying to a SPOR grant, um, this would be the level of engagement that you would be looking at um, because they really want shared decision-making. So at this level, researchers work directly with patient and public engagements where they actively partner with them and uh, throughout the research process. And oftentimes taking, it, oftentimes it's taking place at the beginning stage of the research process to ensure that all the values and the and culture and experiences and concerns are considered and the research process actually reflects uh, their wishes. And decision-making power, it's all in collaboration. Um, so it's shared decision-making power and people are co-creating together. Some of the methods that you can use when you're at this level of engagement is thinking about participatory decision-making and design. There are actual 
um, research methodologies like photo voice that you might want to use, but you can also have advisory groups or people with lived in living experience actually on your research team as well. And some of the important considers is that it requires commitment, um, it requires trust and openness and flexibility. It requires resources and adequate planning and preparation, as well as critical reflexive practice. So really understanding not only um, the relationships that you're building, but also understanding yourself too. And so doing some of that work as well. It's important to consider anti-oppressive and trauma-informed approaches to ensure that people are meaningfully and authentically involved and that you're acknowledging and addressing power imbalances between researchers, healthcare practitioners, members of the public, patient partners, and other research team members as well. And so at the user-directed, or sometimes we say patient-directed, community-led, um, public-directed, uh, this, the people with lived and living experience actually hold all the decision-making power. So the role of the research is more at an advisory level. And some of the important consider, oops, sorry. And some of the, the important considerations that have, that, that need to be addressed um, uh, is, that, is that the role of the researcher is really there to support stakeholders in the process. So thus it's important to do capacity building in terms of conducting research. So a lot of times um, it will all be driven uh, by people with lived and living experience and researchers will be asked, um, so we want to do a knowledge synthesis and researchers will bring their expertise on how to do that, but all of the decisions will be directed by members of the community. And so, oh my goodness, <laughs> my PowerPoints have a mind of their own. So one of the one of the great little tools, and I'll stop sharing for a minute, um, so that I can do this. Oops, there we go. I'll just bring it up. We have a little tool that everyone is can use that can help you when you're navigating these questions. There we go. This is our methods of engagement or methods of patient and public engagement tool. And Trish, maybe you can put the link in there. Is that you have already? Of course you have. Trish is always <laughs> 10 steps ahead. Um, so this is one of the tools that um, you can use. It's on our website and it actually helps you go through all of, oh my goodness, I am, nope, don't want that. Okay, <laughs> so, so what we ended up doing a while back is a lot of people, researchers were saying to us, can I engage just at one decision or do I have to engage people with lived and living experience throughout the entire process? And we always encourage, of course, to engage people with lived and living experience throughout the entire process. But sometimes um, you only have the ability or you're just starting to do engagement. So you think about engaging at one of the decision-making phases or stages. And so what we started thinking was, why don't we process map all the different phases and stages of the research process. So here we have all of the different stages. And then we thought at every level of engagement. So if you are a research team and you're really kind of beginning uh, to do patient public engagement, maybe you're looking at the identifying and prioritizing stage, and maybe it's only at the consult level. But the great thing is as we process mapped all of this wonderful, stuff and the different levels, we actually started looking at different types of participatory approaches that you might want to use. Um, and this is all related to the phase of the research process you're at and the level of engagement you're, you're thinking about at the time. And so, for example, if I was doing a research project, say, on type 2 diabetes, 
And at the time we were really brand new and maybe our research team um, was kind of at the consultation level. We really want input. We really want to know if we're on the right track as far as priorities um, and, and the research question and what we're thinking about. Um, so we want to engage people. So maybe we choose um, 11. So 11, if you look down on the side, is discussion groups. And so look, you can actually click. And then it gives you a nice write up about um, what are discussion groups and how you can use it. Um, and at each of the phase and stage of the research process. And so you can hear my dogs in the background, sorry. Um, so you can take a look at, say, at see here's all the times in which it could be useful. So identifying public and opinions and encouraging open debate. And we have lots of different additional resources and examples as well. And so we can go back again, say we were at a different phase or stage of the research process, say, we're a little bit further along. Maybe we're at the research design and maybe we're actually at the collaborate level. So we're open to engaging and having shared decision-making around the design of the research project. And so the different, the different um, options that we have here are numbered. And so we can take a look, charrettes is one. Um, participatory design is another option. Uh, patient journey mapping could be another way of thinking about our design. Hmm, maybe we'll choose participatory design. And so I can click on that again, and it'll give me a little bit of a synopsis of what is participatory design. Um, when would it be useful to use? So helping to gain insight from patient and public partners, creating opportunities um, for partners to build capacity and skills and strengths in research, all of these different things. And then there's some um, additional resources that you can go to as well. Oh, and look, it even tells you at the bottom where you're at as well, so you never get lost. So this it goes through the entire research process, which is, um, which we've heard from researchers is super helpful, but also if you notice, we're going back again, say, at, say you were at the implementation phase and actually you're at the patient and public directed, this group, this book can also not only be used by research team, but also by community groups, um, people with lived experience, if they are directing the research project and, and, research, and researchers are more as a resource, you can also take a look at patient and public directed, say at the implementation phase, there's different options of different types of participatory approaches that you might want to use. I'm just taking a look at them, <laughs> see which one. Um, oh yeah, there's this reality check where this is actually actively going within the community and this would help you as far as the implementation phase and designing what you're gonna do with your research findings. So how to make a decision at this phase or stage of the research process. So this really starts to give you a little bit of an idea of different types of participatory approaches that you might wanna use as you move through. Now, some of the questions we sometimes get is how do we even get to that point, right? Of how do we make the decision around what level we're at and then move from that to the participatory approach? Well, we actually have another, I'm gonna see if this works. We have another booklet that is also online for um, research teams to use. And that's a readiness to engage workbook. So this would be a workbook that you would work on as team members, as part of the research project. Trish, I'm just double checking. You can see the workbook, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Sometimes I'm like, I might just be talking to my... Um, so the readiness, readiness to engage workbook is something that you can use at the beginning as well to help you as a team decide um, 
what level of engagement you're kind of at, and then also how do you make decisions around what participatory approach to use as well. And so this one we have had a session on before, but I'll just quickly kind of go through. Um, so it has internal questions. So for the research team and external questions to consider for people with lived experience and have conversations to start conversations around where they're at and where they would like to be engaged at. And so some of the internal questions would be for everyone. That would be for researchers, for patient partners, for, for everyone um, being involved in research to do some critical reflexive practice, to think about things like health inequities and what considerations we need to really think about as we're beginning a project together and how we're gonna work together as a team and build that relationship and trust. And so it goes through all sorts of different, um, different questions that you need to consider on your own. And it's a fillable PDF, so you can write out those. And this will be each individual first writing it out. And then you can have a conversation with the entire team about some of your thoughts about what inequities we need to address. What are my own personal values and assumptions? And then some of these questions start getting into as a team, where do we think we're at as far as um, how we think people with lived experience might um, help decision-making? Where is there potential for actual decision-making power? So um, being really open and honest, the conversation around what decision can people really inform and really thinking about how flexible and adaptable the team is if, for example, people with lived experience say you're totally off in the wrong direction we really think you should be doing this well here's kind of the conversation that you need to first have internally as a team to really figure out at what level and so by the end of these questions here because you also have to think about the resources that you have in place. Do you have enough resources to be able to fairly compensate people with lived experience and help ensure that people can meaningfully contribute, um, that, there's, that you're addressing barriers to engagement? Um, so all of these things have to be thought about before you start deciding what level. But also you have to start thinking about who needs to be engaged. And I'm just going to... Then we start going into kind of external questions. So thinking about feasibility and also having conversations with people with lived experience around how they would prefer to be engaged. What are their values and perspectives? What kind of things do we have to consider in that? And so you might find a research team is kind of like, well, we're at the consultation level, but you may have community members saying, we are full collaboration, shared decision making, or nothing at all. And so that's when you have to really have those hard conversations and say, okay, um, how can we make sure, what decisions are we really able to fully share decision making? And how do we navigate this process? And then from there, um, a lot of times when you're talking with community members and building relationships, because the relationship part is so important, um, that's when you start thinking, that's when you can start talking about potential participatory approaches. Do people prefer to get engaged as a group together? Do we want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations? Maybe if it's younger people, are we thinking maybe more of an arts-based project or something? Or do we have enough resources to do that? So as you move forward, you first decide whether you're at the consultation or collaboration level, what decisions you might be able to engage community, and then from there, working together to decide what participatory approach you can use. So between this handbook and the other one that kind of go through, goes through different participatory approaches, this can really help you start to make decisions around how best to engage and at what level you're thinking about as well. So I'll stop sharing. There we go. Oh, and I'll share once again. We'll go back to our presentation. So that's yes, that's our assessing um, external and internal. Now I want to take a pause and just see if there are some questions um, from the audience.
And you can also unmute if you want to ask the question versus having to type it in the chat box. <laughs> Um, no questions so far, but um, Heather did mention uh, Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research, their um, Porlet, uh, it's right. patient-oriented research level of engagement tool um, might be good, and, and the Indigenous research level of engagement tool might be good companions for the, um, I think it was the methods guide. Absolutely. I love that. And we can always maybe in our, like, as we follow up, um, we can, we can send that link as well from our partners over in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. That is a great tool. Great idea, Heather. No questions so far, though, that I can see. No questions. Hmm. That either means I did such a great job describing or else, or else everyone's like, what? I feel like if it was me, I would be digging into those resources <laughs> and checking them out. There's lots of good, yeah. And we have had, I know sometimes we get questions around what happens if like the research team is at one level of engagement and, and, and people with lived experience are at another and, and what happens? Um, how, do you, how do you like have that conversation? And I think a lot of it means, it, a lot of it's in that building of the relationship at the early phases of the engagement process and really having those conversations around values and perspectives and what, what we want to get out of the project together um, before we, we move forward to make some of those decisions. I see Terry Lynn has a question. Do you want me to read it for you? Sure. Um, so they asked, do you pull from an existing pool of patients, families, or do you start uh, with recruiting? Oh, so this is kind of uh, the recruitment of people with lived and living experience. One of the questions we usually like to ask, and I think it's in one of our booklets as well, is we first just want to think about the, the area of health that we're looking at and think about who's affected differently. Um, who has different access to healthcare systems. So thinking about um, not only geographical uh, barriers, so urban versus rural, rural and remote, um, but also thinking about systemic barriers. So what type of barriers people may face like racism, colonialism, transphobia, sexism, ableism within the healthcare, within the healthcare um, system and then thinking about how are we going to engage these different perspectives and so sometimes yes you can start to um, recruit within pre-existing um, groups of healthcare consumers but we also encourage really thinking outside of the box about recruitment as well and how to make uh, and build relationships with different community partners where you might um, be able to engage people who aren't even perhaps accessing an intervention um, at the time because of different barriers. And so really thinking about, and, and one of the ways is to start talking with people with lived experience as well and say, who's missing from the table? Who do you think we need to talk to? Um, you know, brainstorming those ways, talking to other researchers who've engaged in the area of health research as well that you have. They may have some suggestions on people and also identifying community leaders and, and asking them, are there people you think um, would be interested in the project? What would be the best way to approach and, and what level of engagement do you think people would be interested in as well? And I think we've used um, that in a couple of projects that we've done where we first approach um, organizations that serve people with lived and living experience and, you know, people we already know who work in the community and ask them, how should we recruit? How should we go about finding people and talking to people, right? Yeah, 
it's and what method should we use too <laughs> yeah. absolutely and there's been times where we have been kind of this is where the the whole that one booklet came into because we're like oh yeah people just want to do discussion groups and we'll just like move forward on that and then after talking to some community leaders they're saying no like this this subject itself, people may want to do one on one, we know people who will probably be more comfortable, you know, going for a coffee and having a conversation and so it's so important to kind of have those conversations and not necessarily assume this is the way everyone wants to engage. That that leads perfectly into the next question. Um, Marianne asks how to reach an agreement between the research methods and proposals of the participants. Oh, so like, so when you, so when there's disagreement over like the design of the research project, do you think that is? I think, um, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> that, yeah, that can happen too, right? Um, where there might be some disagreement around around that. The, the biggest thing is clear communication. Um, first of all, around at the very beginning, just talking about what the scope of the project is, what we can and cannot not do and, and kind of funding wise. Um, and coming to a compromise. Some, some of the great things about those participatory approaches is that it helps you um, be able to come to a consensus around things and to have those open conversations so it allows for some disagreement to occur and, and for researchers. There are times where unfortunately, um, you unfortunately there's a, the methods wise you've made promises to your funders or there's things that you have to do that you just unfortunately can't um some of the some of the things that that i think are really good is if you aren't able to necessarily use the method that um, people with lived and living experience were really wanting to, at least maybe in if you co-author a paper later on down the road with people with lived experience, actually having that in the discussion, say, you know, it was really suggested by um, people with lived experience that we we do this type of research next time. Um, and, and this would be a consideration for any researcher in this area to think about doing this further. And then hopefully maybe you can get a grant with the group again to do, do something a little bit more um, on the suggested way. But also being open to being adaptable and flexible. There are times where I know in research, we think very much from a deficit base and we may be engaging people with lived and lived, lived and living experience who really want a strengths-based um, research project, one that concentrates on resilience and other things, and to keep, to open, open ourselves up to thinking about doing those types of research projects with community members as well. That was a good question, though. <laughs> there are many times where there's disagreement. <laughs> but having, so, having those conversations is so important. Sorry. And I'm sure you already said this, but the earlier you can have the conversation, the easier it is to co-design and be flexible if you don't already have um, all the methods in place, right? Absolutely. I always encourage, even if you're not at a place in your research studies where you're going to develop a grant yet, or you, if you're even just at the initial stages, but you're thinking of an area that, that might be of interest later on, is just start talking to people with lived experience, having conversations, going for coffee with people, saying I'm not, you know, I haven't started anything yet, but let's start having um, having some conversations about what's important to you, what are some of the values that you hold. Um, if you were to, you know, research what kind of things would be important to you and just starting to build those relationships way you can build them even when you haven't started a grant proposal you can start just talking to people about how and what we should be looking at mm -hmm. 
That's all the questions we have. We're early. <laughs> I just threw uh, the link to the evaluation in the chat. If you could um, complete that when you get a chance, helps us improve these sessions. And our next session is going to be an interesting one. It's on May 10th, and it's about why bodies matter in patient and public engagement. Um, and so it'll be an interesting conversation. I think it's more at the intermediate level, right? Is that what we call it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but we encourage everyone to join um, and, and definitely, um, if you have any questions after today's session, don't never hesitate to send us an email either. And I will send um, a link to the recording and the slides and uh, the evaluation and a link to this session in a follow-up email with everyone who registered. So you'll have that all in one email. Fantastic. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of thank yous in the chat. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Thanks so much for coming. Bye. Bye, everyone.